Welcome back. It's a case that's making national headlines, a murder in Deep River, and the suspect is suspected of being connected to a stabbing spree in Massachusetts. Channel 3's Susan Raff and defense attorney Walter Hussey are joining me this morning to talk about this case. Thank you both. Susan, I want to start with you. You've been covering this from the beginning. I know it's a lot. We could probably spend the next half hour going through the details, but give me the quick rundown of exactly what we know happened. This is a lot, and I think we're going to learn more and more as we go on. We were in court this week uh, when uh, Jared Revisa uh, appeared before a judge and was arraigned. Now, these are the charges in Massachusetts. Now, keep in mind, two crimes happened, uh, or three crimes actually happened on one day. Uh, we have a murder in Deep River, Connecticut, and it's believed that Jared Revisa may have murdered a man there. Bruce Feldman then drove to Massachusetts where uh, he went on a stabbing spree at a McDonald's and also a movie theater. So the case that we heard in Massachusetts was uh, for that McDonald's. There is some question about his mental competency and whether he can stand trial and whether he can defend himself. So he's now at a psychiatric hospital uh, and they're going to determine in the next 20 days uh, if he can. But obviously the big question remains what's going to happen in Connecticut in our Connecticut or is Connecticut State State police going to charge him with that murder and when and we uh, Walt I'm gonna turn to you uh, the one thing we feel pretty confident about is that nothing's gonna happen until he goes back to court right 100%. And so if you got a call and you haven't but just hypothetically you get a call your Jared visa needs an attorney and he calls you what are some of the things you're thinking about at this point well there's a couple ways to look at it if he were to be in Connecticut the first thing is you could address whether or not he was competent what happens in that case is the judge would order an evaluation by a psychiatric team. And that team would have to figure out whether or not he could assist adequately in his defense. In other words, does he know who the defense attorney is and what his role is, which would be me? Does he understand what a prosecutor is? Does he understand what a judge is? Does he understand what the charges are? And the answer to that question comes back either yes or no. And if, if not, whether or not he's restorable and within a certain period of time. So that's what would happen if he was presented in Connecticut. And first. that would be if he's competent to participate in the case. There's also the question of was he competent when this all happened? 100%. Tell that, me about that. Well, that's a different issue. So what he probably could do if it was Connecticut, you'd probably say he's not guilty by insanity, right? And so that's not to a jury, that's to a judge. And you would put on the experts that evaluate him and say, listen, this man wasn't in his right frame of mind when these crimes were committed. And that's how that plays out. We heard from a criminal uh, psychiatrist uh, in the courtroom who uh, pretty much evaluated him for a couple of hours and came back saying that, yes, there are times when he understands things, uh, but she felt that he was delusional, uh, psychotic, that he thought that uh, the mafia was involved with his family, that things were uh, out of his control. Uh, she was very concerned about his mental well-being, which she said for the last two years uh, has been uh, in a crisis level. But I, I think what Walter is saying is that they have to determine if he knows the difference from right or wrong, if he knew at the time. He did leave the scene uh, in all three cases. So, you know, he definitely knew that what he was doing was wrong. Is that enough to uh, allow him to stand trial? I don't know. Well, and the, it end, this all ended with a spectacular car crash fleeing from police. So if you're a defense attorney and your client, you know, maybe has been seen by a psychiatrist, maybe is potentially wasn't competent at the time the crimes were committed, is that bad for that claim? Well, uh, not necessarily. I mean, it really comes down to the experts, you know, like I was saying. So the court would order an evaluation if it were here in Connecticut, and that's the experts in that field would determine yes or no. And then instead of a jury, it would be judge, a judge or judges who would sit and hear that evidence and determine. And in Connecticut, uh, I know he's being held right now at a hospital in Massachusetts, but that would be Whiting Forensic 100%. where he'd be sentenced until he's rehabilitated? Not sentenced, but he, yes, he, he'd be housed there, right? So you'd have to go through the step. You'd have to be found guilty first. And it's the NGI, they call it, not guilty by insanity. And many people are wondering about the idea that there's a potential murder charge in Connecticut. There is some felony assault charges in Massachusetts. Does one trump the other, Walt? No, not necessarily. So I wasn't really sure. This is kind of a, a weird fact pattern. It's almost like a, a law school question in some ways. So I talked to some state's attorneys and public defenders. I think collectively we kind of feel that it's up to uh, the DA who's elected in Massachusetts whether or not he wants to pursue those charges. You have six victims. I mean, you can add that up pretty quickly. He's probably facing a ton of time up there. But what we can do in Connecticut is we, it's something called a governor's warrant, right? So they, they would draft a warrant for murder, uh, spelling out probable cause, and present it to their governor. And you, normally it's uh, honored. But if they said no and they wanted to go forward up there, that's within their you know privy if they wanted to. 
But what would happen is they put a detainer on him. So no matter what happens up there, Connecticut would say, hey, when you're done up there, we have this murder warrant down here. And that's an interesting point, Susan, because I know we've heard from that district attorney up there who is elected, mm -hmm. does need to get reelected. Probably that's important to him. And he's right. got six victims up there who are saying, hey, we want to have our charges uh, heard by a Massachusetts court. Right. That he, factors into this. He was very clear about that when we spoke to him outside of court that, you know, something very tragic happened to these people. And rightfully so. I mean, you had these four young girls who were at a movie theater. The youngest, I think, was nine. Uh, to be scared like that, uh, and there's probably a lot of trauma. Uh, the two employees at the McDonald's, uh, for them to be stabbed like that, we heard from one of the employees at that McDonald's who, uh, a woman who was stabbed multiple times in her arm, who's afraid to go back to work. So, yes, they want to make sure that justice is uh, held for those victims of that. But obviously, I think this big case of murder where Bruce Feldman came out this week that the medical examiner said he had been stabbed multiple times in the head and also his torso, and that's how he died. And there was a relationship of some sort between him and Jared Revisa, and many are wondering what type of relationship that was. There's also some concern. You see there a photo on Instagram um, that poodle belonged to Bruce Feldman, and we believe that dog was also killed and possibly another dog uh, in that home. Walter, if you would gotten a call as we started with, what would be the first things you'd be trying to track down that evaluation? And what, what would your, where would your inquiry start? <laughs> well, you got to start with that, whether or not the man's competent. That's where it all starts. And then from there, you would be either planning to get those experts before the court or beginning your defense? Well, a combination. So, I mean, there's a statutory uh, provision for this. So basically, you petition the court to say, listen, this man needs to be evaluated. That would certainly be uh, agreed to by the court. And then, uh, like I said, the psychiatric team would make a recommendation one way or another if he was competent. And if he wasn't, is he restorable? Right now, he's in Bridgewater Hospital up in Massachusetts. Susan, what do we expect next steps? The next step is he'll be evaluated for the next 20 days. I think the next court date is June 17th, so they'll be back and they'll hear. Uh, so we'll have a better understanding of what happens there. But I think you're right. I think the victims in Massachusetts want justice. I think the DA wants that. So he could be there for a, quite a bit of time. But I think one thing is very certain. He's not going anywhere for quite some time. Yeah, whether it's Connecticut charges or Massachusetts charges. And the fact that Massachusetts currently has him in custody, Walter, that's a key point here. For sure, but it doesn't mean he's going to get away from uh, prosecution here. I mean, we can just sit and wait to see what happens up there. Like I said, they can place a detainer on him, and when that case is resolved one way or another, come back to Connecticut and uh, face the music here. Yeah, but like you said, it could be many, many years between the two states that this guy could be facing if he did, in fact, do this. Right, and the interesting thing I know, and Walter probably knows more about this, is that when you are sentenced in the criminal system of the court, there are set sentences. You can go to Whiting Forensic uh, in Connecticut for a very long time, right? You have to have parole hearings. So right. there is no end date when you go to places like Whiting Forensic. All right. Susan Raff, Walter Hussey, thank you for both being with us. Thank you. Thank you.